I've been asked to, to speak a little bit about democracy. Uh, and specifically, I, I think we're witnessing something going on where the issue of democracy uh, is being revealed as something that nobody really knows what they mean by it. And that some groups have one idea of what democracy means, some groups have another idea. You might have an election, and then one group that professes to be pro-democracy says, well, that's not really democracy uh, because it didn't turn out the way we, we hoped it would. Or we're afraid that the game has been rigged, and so however this democratic contest comes out, we're going to be suspicious of the results, or we're not going to believe that those results really reflect what actually happened. So there's all these conflicting views now about the legitimacy of, of elections, what does democracy mean, who gets to vote, who controls the outcome, uh, can we sue to change the results? All of these sort of things have become much more, have been brought more to the fore in recent years, and there's specific reasons for that. But let's just look at some of the examples. And then once we look at the different ways that democracy is being challenged and being kind of mixed up in how people view it, look at some of the ways that we could really change how democracy affects our lives without getting rid of it. Because I don't, I don't and I'm not saying we shouldn't get rid of it, but I'm saying is it's, it's not going anywhere. And that if you ask people, do you like democracy? Is that a good thing? Overwhelming number of people will say yes. And then if you ask them next, okay, what does democracy mean exactly? Well, they have no idea. And then, of course, some people try to get off the hook by saying, well, I'm in favor of republics, not democracy. So ask them, what does a republic mean? They have no idea. So what I think what we need to do is look then at really how do you use democracy? What is its proper role in society when you're stuck with it, when you got to it, when everybody wants it? What are the underlying conditions that make democracy work reasonably well, and what are the conditions that make it a disaster? Mises had a lot of thoughts on these, and we'll look at at some of those. But first of all, let's look at one side of uh, one group of people who have been attacking their, as they see it, democracy in, in recent years and months. And, and that is, that's coming from the elites, that is the wealthy, the powerful. They have been having some problems with democracy lately. Their problem is that there's been too many of these referendums, there's been too many of these initiatives, there's been too many votes from the ordinary people who've been approving things we don't particularly favor. Examples, of course, are, are Brexit, uh, is probably the most high profile, biggest example of that. And so immediately after the Brexit, Brexit vote took place, of course, then we started to hear about, well, it's non-binding, we really should have parliament vote on it. Uh, it was all just a bunch of crazy hicks who voted yes, and, and so on. And maybe we should have some, we, oh, let's, let's sue, maybe the courts can really give us some guidance here. The idea was immediately to act as though the, the majority vote in that case was, was not valid, should not be adhered to. This is, of course, the opposite of what we often hear from, from the wealthy elites, which, who, when democracy goes their way, tell us how important it is, how we should always respect the will of the majority, and so on. And other examples, of course, also are there was a Hungarian vote on immigration quotas on how many bills should be allowed to, to migrate to Hungary. Well, that was that passed overwhelmingly, that there should be, in fact, limits. Of course, it was immediately pointed out, well, only a certain percentage of the population voted on that. Uh, of course, don't expect to hear that same argument if only a certain population of Americans vote in this presidential election, which, of course, will be the case. And other... Uh, examples include a, a recent vote in Colombia where there was a peace deal uh, worked out by the government there and then they had a referendum on whether that peace deal would be accepted by the population overall and they voted it down. And then what that immediately led to just days later were uh, articles in the New York Times and other similar organizations saying, well, this whole referendum thing, it's not really democratic. We really need to rethink all of this stuff where we're allowing people to vote on laws directly, really what we need is to, is to let uh, the more reasonable people in the legislators, in the legislatures, the, uh, the more educated people, really determine what's best for us and really get rid of all this direct democracy stuff. Now, maybe that's a good argument, but it's certainly not the argument that they've been making for decades, which is that we need more democracy, we need more voting, the outcomes of those, they reveal what the general will is. And what they really want, of course, which was quoted in the New York Times article, 
uh, was this, as noted, and so I'm quoting, former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and U.S. diplomat George Kennan argued that foreign affairs should be uh, in the realm of the, quote, prophetic minority who understood what was in the best interests of citizens. And now, of course, it's especially important in foreign affairs because the, the common people, they don't know about those important things. Uh, but this, of course, is extended to everything as well. We need the courts. Uh, we need the legislatures to really be able to veto these things. And that's what we saw, of course, out uh, in the result of the Brexit vote. Veto, have Brexit vote against it. Maybe we can have the Scottish Parliament veto Brexit somehow. Surely there's a way to overcome the way that these people have voted. But then, of course, when the legislature does something uh, in a similar way that the elites don't like, well, then we don't want the parliament voting on things. A perfect example of that would, would be the impeachment of the president in Brazil, where Dilma Rousseff was impeached by the legislature there, the democratically elected legislature. So what you had was the people voted on Rousseff. They voted her into office two years earlier. And then the legislature come back, itself democratically elected, decided to impeach her and threw her out of office. And then we were treated to all kinds of articles from the New York Times and so on saying, well, this is an affront to democracy. This isn't democracy because the people chose Rousseff and now we've got this legislature uh, getting rid of her. Now, of course, in the Brexit case, we need the legislature to do the right thing. But in the Brazil case, the legislature did something, but that was wrong. So which is it? It apparently is just whatever happens to fit the thinking of the New York Times and its friends. And then, of course, at, at the state level in the United States, this happens all the time, where the states will approve referenda, and then it, uh, if we don't like that enough, then we just sue enough times until the federal courts overturn it. A case in point would be uh, the ban on gay marriage that California voted on, uh, approved that, and then we just had the courts overturn that. And so there's always ways around it. But what isn't admitted, of course, is that uh, nobody seems to be agreeing on what this democracy means. And so that has really been exposed more in recent days. We used to paper it over a, a, a lot more, but now with so many high-profile referenda and initiatives, it's becoming more of an issue. Now, at the same time, you've got other groups that are attacking democracy from another angle, and they become very concerned about it. And they, and they don't trust the elections, and they see maybe the elections as uh, not reflecting what they really think. And to, and to look at this, we could ask ourselves, well, why are there so many referenda now, so many high-profile referenda, so many initiatives? Well, part of it is because people don't feel that the people in the legislatures, that the executives are actually reflecting what their real views are. They, they see that, well, all those people who are up in Congress or in the national legislature, they have their own views. And then we have our views, and they're never going to bring our views to a vote. So we're going to have to have a referendum. It's the only way we can make our voice heard. So you're starting to see this greater division then between what it is that the elected officials say and do and think and what it is that the rest of us say and do. We cannot trust our elected officials to actually do things that we think are important. However, uh, another reason that uh, there have been greater attacks from the, the, the side of the, the common people, if you will, is that they, they simply fear the outcomes of elections more. As governments become more and more powerful, then what that means is that the outcome of each election could possibly do you more harm. If you have a weak government that doesn't do very much, or it's decentralized, and you have, it's okay, the feds might have one agenda, but maybe at your state level you can have a different agenda and there can be some conflict there and maybe mitigate the problems. As one central government becomes more and more powerful, then you start to fear more and more what could happen with the next election. And so once you fear the next election more, well, then suddenly the, high, the stakes are higher and maybe you start to get a little bit more suspicious about whether the outcomes are really there, about whether this really reflects what actually happened. If there's so much power at stake for the central government, wouldn't it, it be in their best interest then to manipulate the outcome? And so a powerful government simply breeds suspicion of the electoral process. It's the natural outcome. Now, and of course, when you live in a place where there are also lots of different conflicting political groups, then you start to fear that one of those groups might become especially powerful. And Mises looked at this. He, he looked at how democracy really can't sustain itself in a situation where the state is strong enough to really favor one group, one interest group uh, over another. And he looked at this in the context of immigration. And in Liberalism, his book, he talks about uh, the case of Australia specifically. And what he says is, the present inhabitants of Australia fear that someday they could be reduced to a minority 
in their own country. It cannot be denied that these fears are justified because of the enormous power that today stands at the command of the state. A national minority must expect the worst from a majority of a different nationality. As long as the state is granted the vast powers which it has today and which public opinion considers as its right, the thought of having to live in a state in the hands of an opposing group is terrifying. Now, he's talking about, uh, in his case, in the 20s, he was talking about large numbers of people from neighboring countries moving uh, to Australia. But as Mises knew, you could apply this logic to any number of interest groups. It's not just foreign nationals that, who might take control of the government and impose laws on you. The problem could be anything. It could be uh, looking at the vast scope of American history. It could be uh, union groups. It could be communists. It could be Catholics or Protestants or Muslims or the Irish or any of these other groups that over the decades of American history we have feared would take control of, uh, of the levers of government. Now, that, of course, never translated much in the U.S. into, most cases, violent uh, uprising or truly hysterical fears. Why? Because people realized that the federal government was relatively weak and could not impose a lot of what might have been imposed if you know, Group X takes over. However, as Mises notes, once you have a, a government that you truly fear, if you have a president who rules with a pen and a phone, as Obama said, right, we don't need Congress, we, we, I don't need the courts, I'll just pass laws unilaterally. So now you're in a situation where whatever interest groups control that guy, that's what you have to fear. Now, so Mises said, well, the only reason that the only way you can overcome this problem of, of fearing these groups taking over would be to have a weaker government. And Mises says, it is clear that no solution to this problem is possible if one adheres to the idea of the interventionist state, which meddles in every field of human activity. So if the government is empowered to meddle in every field of human activity, well, you better fear when someone else takes over because then they'll be able to do whatever they want. So the answer, of course, is then to embrace a more laissez-faire state. And if you're stuck with democracy, that's what you're going to get. And of course, even if you don't have elections, if you find yourself in a minority situation, you're going you're to be on the losing side of things, even in an authoritarian state without elections. So uh, this issue of majorities oppressing minorities is always present, but it is only mitigated then if you have a weaker state. Now, moving on then, let's look at, at some of the things that, that must be done then in order to really uh, change the role of democracy and really to, to take a different look, to expose some of the problems with what the current narrative is about democracy. We, we've all seen that we can't agree with what it is, and we've all seen that people fear the outcomes, and that some elections are good, some are bad, we don't, if things go against us, well, that's, a, that's a, a miscarriage of democracy. If they go our way, it's fine. But we really need to embrace some other ways of changing the whole way that we define it and view it. And we don't even have to get rid of elections then. We don't have to get, again, get rid of democracy. This will really change the way that democracy works if we can do these three, three things. There are other things we could do, of course, too, uh, like secession. But let's just, here's three that I'll propose. Change ideology. That's a big thing, is if you've, got a, if you've got a population that wants a certain type of government, that's what you're going to get, whether you have elections or not. And Mises noted this. He said that the Russian, writing the 1920s, the Russian conservative is undoubtedly uh, correct when he points out that Russian czarism and the police of the czar was approved by the great mass of the Russian people, so that even a democratic state could not have given Russia a different system of government. There's this belief among many people who forward democracy that it somehow leads necessarily to liberal results, liberalism being laissez-faire government. But of course, liberal, uh, democracy can be used to forward any ideology and the agenda of any group. And as Mises points out here, it could be used to forward czarism if that's what most people want. What matters is the ideological underpinnings of the society in general and what the people believe government should do. So if you want, if you want democracy to lead to better outcomes, You've got to convince people that they want better outcomes. And as long as people are voting with the intent of empowering government to do X, Y, Z, you're probably going to get X, Y, Z. And even if you don't have elections, you'll probably eventually get X, Y, Z. And then the second thing we need to do is end the idea that uh, the general will uh, is, is reflected in democracy. 
And uh, uh, Mises wrote about this. He said, grave injury has been done to the concept of democracy by those who conceived of it as a limitless rule of the volant general, that is the, the general will. There is really no essential difference between the unlimited power of the democratic state and the unlimited power of the autocrat. Now we hear about this all the time. Every time there's a, an election, we hear about, well, this is what the people wanted and, and the president has a mandate and, and now we know what direction to take the country in because we had this election. But of course, a lot of times it's just built on pure conjecture. And I mean, even if we just look at who voted and in what uh, percentages, it, it means nothing at all. To draw the conclusion that we now know what the, the general will is, is completely nonsensical. And we can just look at this in American history. A lot of time we're told about these landslides, about all these great victories that these, these politicians achieved, when a lot of the time they didn't even get a majority, they just simply got a plurality of the votes. So that the majority of the voters actually voted against whoever had won. But whoever was declared the winner, whether it be by the Supreme Court or, or by the county clerks, well now we know what all the voters wanted. And of course this is a huge field in uh, political sciences, how, are the, how is the will of the voter translated into public policy? Well, nobody knows. And of course, we can't assume that just five people in a room who voted for Hillary Clinton, why did they vote for her? What did they want her to do? Could have five probably totally different answers. And so this conjecture, this idea that, well, this candidate won and now reflects the will of 300 million people is certainly one of the most nonsensical things we could possibly say in politics. But let's, let's just look at the idea of uh, what is the general will? Well, looking back at uh, the 1980 election, we see that Reagan won that with 50% of the popular vote. So was, was the general will then that Reagan can do whatever Reagan wanted to do? Uh, that was just 50% of the voting population. If we look, of course, at the percentage of the total population that voted for Reagan, the number is 19%. So fewer than one in five Americans voted for the winner in that case. And now even if you take out children and all of that, you still come up with about 30% of the general population. So what that means is that uh, about 70% of the, of the you know, working age people in their prime, or about 80% of the people overall, either didn't care enough to vote for Reagan or wanted somebody else. And then, of course, in the huge blowout of 1984, we're told where, and of course, we've all seen the Electoral College map where Mondale got Minnesota and the District of Columbia. Wow, look at what a blowout victory. Well, in reality, Reagan got 58% or 23% of the overall population that voted for him. And that was, of course, the hugest blow we've had in decades. If we look at 1992, uh, where Clinton won in a three-way race, he managed to get a whopping 43% of the people who voted, which translated to 17% of the population overall. So that's, that was the general will. 17% of the population let us know exactly the direction that everything should go in. So how that amounts to the general will, I'm not quite sure. And then on top of that, of course, we had three elections in a row where the, the declared winner didn't win a majority at all. They got a plurality. You had 92, 96, and 2000. And then, of course, in 2000, uh, Bush got 47% of the vote, or 17% of everybody, and Gore got 48% of the vote, and slightly over 17% of everybody. And, uh, well, what was the general will in that case? And... So it, it, this, this argument should simply be revealed as really just a matter of, okay, it's, it's a legal fiction we've invented. Yep, they managed to win 42, 43% of the voters' approval. But why should that translate into a particular set of laws being set in motion? Now, I recognize that, sure, you want somebody in that position, you want somebody to be president, fine. But why should, it be, why should we accept that whatever that guy wants as equivalent to what the voters want? There's no reason. But part of the reason that they get away with it is because people accept this idea, and this brings us to our third uh, thing we need to change about people's views of, of elections, is that once the election is over, then we're all supposed to just sit back and accept the winner and kind of do, do what they want. And that the time for complaining is over, and there's not, there's not going to be any more of that. And this was revealed in an interesting discussion that took place in the Colorado Springs Daily just a, just a few days ago. 
And it was revealed in a comment, subtly revealed in a comment that someone made when they were arguing against mail-in ballots. Now, whatever you think of mail-in ballots, this is an interesting uh, thing he said. He said, by, by stretching the voting period over a span of weeks, uh, mail ballots also raise the likelihood that voters will miss important information when they vote because late breaking news about a candidate might come after they voted. Now, I wonder, is this person aware that late breaking news can occur after election day? And it seems not. The reason, of course, that he says this is because he has bought into the idea that Election Day somehow sprinkles pixie dust on the population and that, well, now Election Day is over, so late breaking news doesn't matter. Now, of course, if Hillary is arrested the day after the election, well, she's president too late. And of course, we don't have laws that actually cover that, so I guess we'll just have the Supreme Court decide if Kane becomes president at that point. And of course, it's a very good possibility that she'll be elected, assuming she's elected with, say, 45% of the vote. So great, we've got someone who got 45% of the vote, and then we're gonna have the Supreme Court decide if the VP after she's elected, but it's the day after the election, so you voters, too late. Can't do anything about it now. And this is the philosophy that underlies the whole concept of election day and voting, is that, well, we voted for this person and now you gotta sit back for four years and do whatever. Just kind of let it all pass you by. Now, as part of, part of the, the underlying issue, of course, uh, what he's saying here also is that, uh, well, what this, what this is an argument is, is that late breaking news might come after the election. This is an argument actually for more frequent elections or for simply saying that, well, what happens on election day is just, just you should approach it with caution and continue to oppose the outcome. But we're told, you know, no opposing the outcome because we're Americans and the mantle of legitimacy is draped over the winner and so on. When in reality, what we need to be telling people about elections is, well, the election is really just the opening act in the future of politics. Is okay, some groups, you know, oh, look, 18% of the people said this person should be president. Okay, well, now what's the next step? The next step is to vehemently oppose whatever it is the new president does. The next step is to constantly try to legitimize them. The next step is to try and get them impeached. The next step is to constantly sue the administration. The next step is to get your members in Congress to oppose this person every chance they get. But you're not supposed to do that because democracy says this person is now president and they have the general will behind them. So. When election day is over, just keep a few things in mind. Keep in mind that only a small percentage of people actually voted for this person. That the fact that, that voting, that uh, election day has come and gone doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean you need to wait four years before any action is taken. Now you'll be told if you try to say nasty things about the new president that, uh, well, this is just madness. You can't impeach a person because the people voted for him. Yes, you can let the legislature impeach them because 18% of the population voted for them. You'll hear what you heard in Brazil, which is that, well, you can't impeach because it, it's contrary to the will of the people. And I have no doubt that that will happen. But this whole idea needs to be overcome. This idea that, well, ideology doesn't matter because de uh, democracy uh, really tells us what's important. You can't make arguments that are contrary to the general will that the whole idea of the general will is obviously nonsense, and then this idea that we all have to shut up after election day. But at the same time, now is ripe, now is the good time to start making these things because now nobody can seem to agree on what democracy is. You've got the elites attacking it from one side, and you've got the common people attacking it from another, and so really the whole issue is up in the air, and so maybe, maybe we can start to really uh, start to bite into the issue of democracy and start getting people to really rethink what it really means. Is it something that dictates to us what we should think? Or should we really use it as an opportunity to talk about the nonsense of trying to act like people who vote somehow provide power to the state to do whatever it wants? So thank you very much. <laughs>